Hello and welcome. The historic struggle for Palestine is characterized as the claims and counterclaims of Arabs and Jews. But one often overlooked factor behind the birth of Israel and the Palestinian Nakba, the catastrophe, is the part played by an old imperial power, Britain. Whose interests were best served by the British in Palestine? How did it honor its mandated duty of care? And what were the calculations and miscalculation it made in redrawing the map of Palestine and reshaping its history? Well, the 67 words of the Balfour Declaration and the 65 years of Israeli statehood continue to cause conflict and controversy. If history is written by the victors, who are the rewriters of history as new information? new documents, new historians come to light. After a century of British involvement in Palestine, it is time to take stock of the cliches and propaganda that serve competing interests and examine how history itself is the battleground for the hearts and minds of new generations today. To discuss the historic events that led to the Nakba, the birth of Israel, and the making of history, we are joined here in London by Rosemary Hollis, Professor of Middle East Policy Studies at City University London and former head of the Middle East Programme at the Royal Institute of International Affairs, also known as the Chatham House. James Renton, Senior Lecturer in History at Edge Hill University and author of The Zionist Masquerade, The Birth of the Anglo-Zionist Alliance. And last but not least, Avi Schleim, Emeritus Professor of International Relations at Oxford University, author of Collusion Across the Jordan, King Abdullah, the Zionist Movement and the Partition of Palestine. And more recently, Israel and Palestine. But first, to mark the 65th anniversary of Al Nakba, Al Jazeera has been airing a special series on its roots and ramifications. The outbreak of World War I in 1914 created new opportunities to reshape the Middle East. strategy <laughs> In 1917, the British cabinet, headed by Prime Minister David Lloyd George, pledged to establish a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. At the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, Britain was represented by Prime Minister David Lloyd George and Arthur Balfour. A delegation from the Zionist organization attended, headed by Chaim Weizmann. They presented a map, seen here, proposing the area to be allocated for a Jewish homeland. In 1922, the League of Nations formalized British rule in Palestine. The second clause of the British Mandate document approved by the League of Nations stipulated, the British mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under political, administrative, and economic conditions that will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home. British High Commissioner Herbert Samuel decreed Hebrew as an official language of Palestine alongside Arabic and English. The letters E and Y were added to the word Palestine in Hebrew as an abbreviation of the words Eretz Yisrael, meaning Land of Israel. <laughs> In the 1930s, the number of Jews immigrating to Palestine began to increase significantly. From 4,000 in 1931, the figure jumped to 9,500 the following year. In 1933, the number rose to 30,000. In 1934, 42,000, and in 1935, a further jump to 62,000. The English, the English, حطوا مخيا حطوا مين حطوا المركز بل هذا على الطريق. هذه الأراضي عم بتروح. الوعد عم ينفذ. 
غياب اي تفاعل معها من الحكم البريطاني في قمع وفي بطش وفي قوانين رهيبه في الحكم البريطاني. In 1945, following the end of World War II, US President Harry Truman appeared to encourage the Zionist agenda by recommending the 100,000 displaced Jews in Europe be allowed to emigrate to Palestine. In February 1947, Britain announced the decision to end its mandate in Palestine. Its spokesman said his country would turn over the difficult situation to the United Nations. Britain was now washing its hands of Palestine, setting in motion events that would lead towards the momentous year of 1948. Gentlemen, Rosemary, welcome. Rosemary, let's start with you. So here we had a declaration that basically promised a national homeland for the Jews in Palestine. What basically motivated the Balfour Declaration? From reading all of your writings, apparently there is an evangelical angle, there's a Zionist angle, there's a colonial angle, perhaps a humanitarian angle. Let's start with the evangelical. Is there an evangelical roots for that declaration? For those British members of the British establishment at the time, who were Christian with an evangelical bent, mm -hmm. uh, yes. But I think it's important to recognize that the, the man who penned the original letter to Lord Rothschild, uh, in other words, Lord Balfour, uh, was not motivated by an evangelical Christian mission. In fact, at the same time as he was writing that letter, he was also shepherding through the British Parliament a piece of legislation which would limit Jewish immigration to Britain. But is there a contradiction between promising national homeland for the Jews in Palestine and passing laws that are not friendly to Jews in England? They were, there's no contradiction whatsoever. They, in fact, they were mooting the idea of a Jewish homeland somewhere else in the empire. The British were in imperial vein. They thought it was okay to organize the lives of other people, to move groups around. They were busy in the First World War anticipating moving uh, people from the Indian subcontinent mm. to Mesopotamia, what became Iraq. They thought that was what you do. It's all part of the empire. Exactly. James, uh, what I've read of, uh, of Arthur Balfour is that he thought of himself as an instrument of divine, of the divine or divine intervention, as a mystic Christian of sort. I think the religion aspect to a significant extent is a red herring. Uh, it was a, uh, a profound contribution to the reason why members of the British establishment were so readily able to accept one of the, the, the key tenets of Zionist ideology, that the Jews were a nation, an ancient nation. Mm -hmm. They saw Palestine as the holy land, mm -hmm. as the promised land, as the landscape of the drama of the Bible. Probably the primary reason for the Balfour Declaration uh, was propaganda, in that uh, in 1917, the British government was desperate to stem uh, the, uh, the tide of pacifism in Russia, uh, the tide of revolutionary socialism in Russia, and to try to keep Russia in the war. At the same time, they were desperate to try to mobilize the full resources of the United States in the conflict. And it was believed in the British establishment um, that Jews held tremendous power in Russia and also in the United States. Does that smell of a bit of anti-Semitism? Absolutely. Um, it, it was uh, shaped by an anti-Semitic belief. That the Jews control in, centers in, of power. In, in, in Jewish influence. Before we go to the Jewish influence, and on the question of evangelism, uh, Avi. I think the there is a view that the Balfour Declaration was inspired by um, knowledge of the Bible, sympathy for the Jews, uh, and uh, recognition of the Jews as an ancient nation. Uh, and according to this view, um, Zionism was a noble project, and the Balfour Declaration was a noble and alt altruistic uh, move on the part of the British government. I completely Uh, reject this explanation of the motives behind the Balfour Declaration. And it seems to me that 
the driving force behind the Balfour Declaration was not the Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour, but the Prime Minister um, David Lloyd George. Mm -hmm. And the timing is significant. November 1917, when Britain was not doing at all well uh, in the First World War, and uh, Britain was uh, anxiously looking for allies from any quarters it could find. And the support for Zionism was based on a misperception, a misperception of the British political elite and by Lloyd George in particular. Lloyd George thought that the Jews were a really powerful force mm -hmm. in world politics. He thought that the Jews made the wheels of history turn. Mm -hmm. And therefore, by issuing this declaration in support of Jewish national aspirations in Palestine, he would acquire a really powerful ally in the war. I think we have to be very careful about a distinction between the British desire to try and enlist the, uh, what they imagine to be the weapon for uh, warfare of winning over Jewish world opinion during the conflict and imperial designs. Mm. There were some members of the British government who thought that Zionism would be a useful way to try to secure British control of Palestine after the First World War. Um, now, there was a general consensus in the British government that obtaining control of Palestine uh, was an important thing in terms of Britain's imperial security, because Palestine was supposed to act as a bulwark to Egypt and the Suez Canal, the artery of the British Empire. Um, but I think it's important that we acknowledge um, that there are only a few members of the government who thought that Zionism uh, would be a useful way to go mm. about doing that. That there is no point in making enemies of the Arabs? Uh, the point is, is that there was a profound consensus within the government about Jewish power and its importance for the war. We have to remember that in 1917, everything was at stake. It wasn't just a question yeah, of sitting back and carefully planning. You're also talking about decision-making in London, future. aren't you? And yes. uh, across the empire, you certainly had the, the classic British Arabists and you had the, the, the servants of the crown working in India who had a completely different perspective on what was likely to be the consequence of facilitating the creation of a Jewish home in Palestine. I mean, there were those who were servants of the empire in the subcontinent who were worried of the effect that it would have on Muslims in India. And I'd like to suggest one additional motive, which is anti-French um, uh, sentiment, because empires are much, great powers are much more concerned with the relations with one another than they are with minorities and... Uh, the subjects. The, yes, the subject. Yes. So behind the uh, Balfour Declaration, there is a colonial mindset which dismissed as of no significance um, the Arab majority, the Muslim majority in Palestine. But there is also a calculation which was directed against the French because in 1916, Britain and France signed the Sykes-Picot Agreement, a secret agreement to carve up the Middle East into spheres of influence between them. And uh, Palestine wasn't assigned either to Britain or to, to France. And Lloyd George uh, thought that was a mistake mm -hmm. and he wanted to um, uh, acquire Palestine for the British sphere of influence. And one way of doing this is forming the alliance with the Zionists who would then claim Palestine and then would Britain would have an entree into Palestine through its Zionist allies. How would you in this context um, judge or evaluate the language used in those very few words of the declaration? The wording is fascinating, yes. which is why uh, scholars have been dis um, uh, discussing them ever since. Um, the Balfour Declaration promised British support for the establishment of a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine, provided it didn't prejudice the civil and religious rights of the non-Jewish communities in Palestine. Now, in 1917, the Jews were 10% of the population, and the Muslims were 90%. And it's absurd to offer a national home, national rights, to a minority of 10% and ignore the rights, the natural rights mm -hmm. of, the, of the majority. But that's precisely what uh, Balfour did in his declaration, and that's why it's such a classic uh, 
colonial document. Okay, but I, I don't think it's only colonial. I, I'm always fascinated by the capacity of the British to depict things in a way that kind of gl glosses over the kind of problems that, that logic, the logic of the words, the document, mm. would imply. Such and, as? Uh, well, basically, that this homeland, they didn't define mm. what the size of it would be. They didn't define what the population spread would end up being. They didn't th trouble themselves with whether it would be a kind of cultural home mm. or uh, it would be a sovereign state. In fact, I don't think most of the British establishment envisaged sovereign statehood for anybody in the empire at that time. But empires do thrive on generalities, don't they? They don't or care for nuance and detail. And ambiguities. Ambiguities. Uh, which because are, they're the ones who can interpret yes, it later. Yes, uh, I, I, to suit their own to interests. Exactly. But the ambiguities that are not constructive ambiguities, they are destructive ambi ambiguities for the subjects. Yes. And the wording of the Balfour Declaration came back to haunt the British in the interwar period. The dialogue between the Zionists and the um, British authorities went as follows. The Zionists said, but you promised us uh, a state. And the British replied, no, we didn't uh, promise you a state. We promised you a national home, which isn't the same. So the arguments continue about the meaning of the declaration. But didn't Lord George come, come back in 1922 or so and say, yes, we were talking about a Jewish state? Yes. Well, so I, I think that the, there's, there's two points that need to be made here, though, about the terminology. Um, uh, the first is, is that when they were drafting the declaration, the focus was on its potential impact on world Jewry outside of Palestine. Um, there was hardly any discussion in the cabinet at all as to what the future might be uh, for Zionism. And a big part of that, the, 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 the inability to truly understand uh, the populations that were affected. Mm. Um, on the one hand, uh, the uh, Palestinian population uh, were not considered to be a national community. They were considered to be a hodgepodge. Right. Uh, they were thought by the British not to be a, a significant concern. Um, and in addition to that, the British also completely, uh, for the most part, completely misunderstood Zionism. They thought that mainstream Zionism was not a status movement. They misunderstood Jews and Zionism and Arabs. They thought that they were backward. They thought Jews were more advanced than Arabs, but they thought that both communities were backward. And they assumed that because they were backward, uh, they would never seriously consider that they would actually have proper independence. Now, moving on, by the mid-30s with the Arab-Palestinian revolt, now we have a British uh, white paper that speaks of perhaps two states on Palestine or in parts of Palestine. Does that mean that the British started by then regretting some of the stuff that they were making in the early part of the century? I think in 1937, when you have the report of the Palestine Royal Commission that, mm -hmm. that sent to Palestine uh, to figure out what's going wrong and what should be uh, the future direction, I think it's hugely significant that this is the first time that the British start to think about what the end game might be. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the Commission plumps for the solution, the two-state solution, given that the declaration, the Balfour Declaration, was issued in 1917, and the British government only seriously considers where all of this is heading in the long term um, in 1937. Well, we, in between a lot of questions. Wiles, in between worlds, the Balfour Declaration has been written into the League of Nations mandate. So, under the terms of the mandate, the British are supposed to implement it, that carry through on the Balfour Declaration. One of the other things they're supposed to do and didn't do is to set up assemblies of the population in Mandate Palestine for them to participate in the running of their own affairs, and they neglected to do so. So, um, briefly, uh, obvious. the um, British wrote the Balfour Declaration into the terms of the League of Nations mandate over Palestine, and then it became a legal commitment. But the British realized in the interwar period that they had made a mistake. They were saddled with these incompatible promises, and they had to somehow manage the two conflicting communities that they had encouraged during um, the First World War. Uh, and there was no solution. There was one land and two people, and this was the conflict was about. The, the British 
philosopher Isaiah Berlin compared the British man mandate over Palestine to a minor British public school where there was the high commissioner who was high-minded and fair-minded and wanted justice for everybody but the assistant masters were much more sympathetic to the um, Arabs right. um, than they were to the Jewish uh, uh, boys who had the irritating habit of uh, writing letters to their influential uh, relatives around the world complaining about everything from the quality of food to the quality of the teaching. Well, they, they, they may have been uh, marginally more sympathetic to the Arabs, but they were arrogant towards both. I, 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 I think that the key thing here is it brings yeah, us back to the Balfour Declaration is that the fact that the British did not define, did not define what a national home was. Mm. And there's a reason for that. The reason being is that, first of all, the Balfour Declaration was issued primarily for concerns outside of Palestine during the war. But also, the British assumed that they could easily manage what they, decide, what they thought was mainstream Zionism, which was non-status Zionism. They also thought they made a, another significant error in that they thought that the Palestinians were not a nation and would eventually accept Zionism because they thought that the Zionists and the Jews were quasi-Europeans. Not real Europeans, quasi-Europeans, right. almost white, They became but not Europeans quite. when they went to Palestine, I guess. More European, but never right. quite there. Be before we end, I just need to finish up with 1947, Avi. So here we have recently uh, a new classified inform information or documents released. And as in, uh, here the Guardian in uh, April 26 says that the British government knew from the moment it planned to withdraw its forces from Palestine more than six years ago, 1947, that partition of the territory and the founding of the state of Israel would lead to war and the defeat of the Arabs, as a secret document revealed. So actually, their, their departure was as controversial as their arrival in Palestine. Yes, um, and as dishonest as their arrival in Palestine, because uh, during the twilight of the British mandate, they also played a double game uh, officially, they disengaged. There was a UN partition plan to partition um, mandatory Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state, and the British refused to implement this UN resolution, so they stood back. But they knew full well, as the documents reveal, that there would be a, a war and that the Arabs would lose and that the Jews will come out on yes, top. Yes, but we shouldn't leave the impression hold that they wanted that war. Hold, hold, that, hold that thought, uh, Rosemary. These were the days of empire. As it were, we will take a news break, and when we come back, we'll discuss more about both the British and the Israeli narratives on Palestine when we come back from a news break. <laughs> Time Weissman beside him, former British Prime Minister David Lloyd George reaffirmed his own Zionist credentials. It is as your German has reminded you, it is nearly 16 years since he recruited me to the Zionist movement. <laughs> Palestine, barren and malarial swamp have been converted into happy settlements. British news bulletins at the time described Palestine as akin to a desert. The reality was very different. Well, welcome back. Rosemary, you were talking about whether they did or did not intend for that to be part of their war. In our earlier discussion, we were mentioning what the fortunes of the British in the First World War meant for their decisions about Palestine. We should remember that by 1947, whilst they were on the winning side in the Second World War, the British were a spent force completely. It was the beginning of the end of the empire. 1947 is the year that they withdrew from India. Uh, Palestine was only one of the places from which they felt they had to retreat because they didn't have the power or the will to suppress opposition to their presence yes. and hold on. And they basically organized themselves to get out of Palestine, uh, 
they didn't feel that they had the capacity to implement the two-state solution. And they favored and they acknowledged in their own records that they were favoring the Jewish community uh, in the way that they organized their retreat. Why? They, because they needed the port of Haifa to get away. They knew that the, the Yeshuv, the Jewish community, the Zionist organizations were much better organized. And could be much of a service for the empire. Than and that they could do a deal with them to get all the British forces, presence, equipment, and so on out. Uh, the, the, there wasn't the possibility of a deal with any kind of Palestinian authority to do that. Yeah. Let's get to the Israeli narrative, uh, Avi. So here we have a narrative that says, look, this is a prosecuted people came back to the home of their forefathers. They were attacked by a huge number of Arabs and armies, and they miraculously won their independence. What is right and what is wrong with this narrative? Um, th this is the standard Zionist uh, narrative about the origins and the course of um, the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and it portrays the Jews as the victims of this conflict. But in the final outcome, it was the Palestinians who were uh, uh, the victims. Uh, there is a, a large Zionist historiography about this conflict, which um, elaborates on this narrative. But in the late 1980s, a new group of Israeli historians emerge. Uh, um, Benny and you Morris, are one of them. Ilan Pape, mm -hmm. and um, myself, I am one of them. Uh, and with the help of Israeli and British and American and UN documents, we mounted a frontal assault right. on all the legends that have come to surround uh, the 1948 war and the birth of um, Israel. So why do the old historians refer to you as not new and not historians? Um, because they don't like the conclusions that we have reached uh, in our rewriting of the history of 1948 on the basis of the new evidence. So let's take, for example, the idea that Israel was attacked by a number of Arab armies and they, are, they have miraculously won the war of independence against them. Uh, OK. Well, um, uh, the Israeli narrative says that the whole of the Arab world was united behind a clear war aim, which is uh, to throw the Jews in, into the sea and to strangle the infant Jewish state uh, at birth. But if you look at the Arab coalition that invaded Palestine on the 5th of May 1948, uh, which consisted of five Arabs, the regular armies of five Arab states plus irregular Palestinian forces, you'll see that it's the most bitterly divided, disorganized, and ramshackle coalition in the history of warfare. And there was no united Arab war aim. Uh, but certainly the Syrians and the Jordanians weren't united. They were actually not. afraid of one another. Yes. The, there was a rivalry between Egypt and the Hashemite uh, countries ruled by um, Hashemite uh, rulers in Iraq and Transjordan. Lebanon and um, Syria were afraid of King Abdallah's project an ambition for greater Syria to incorporate Lebanon and Syria in his kingdom. So there are very, very different agendas in, in this conflict. What about uh, la uh, people without a land going to a land without a people? I think it's perhaps us dwelling for a moment on the profound connection of what we were talking about before, which is the British connection to the evolution of the conflict and Zionist mythology and also Palestinian mythology. Um, the mainstream uh, idea, sense of things, is that actually the, the, the British betrayed Zionism. Um, and on the other hand, a mainstream uh, Palestinian uh, view and Arab view is that the, uh, the British colluded with the Zionists. But I think it's very important nonetheless that we don't fall into this trap of going one side or another, that we acknowledge that there was also profound ambivalence amongst the British about the Zionist project uh, right up until uh, the end of the mandate. 
I think there's a continuity between uh, Ernest Bevin, the British Foreign Secretary, who was directing Palestine policy at the end of the mandate, and his fear uh, that a Jewish state would become a satellite for the Soviet Union and feared Jewish communism. And I think it's important that we avoid the trap of falling into two very straightforward, nice and simple narratives that really derive from um, the beginnings of the mandate in the 1920s onwards about the British were the good guys or the British were the bad guys. Well, the British themselves obviously have their narrative and it's different from the other two. And it, it basically, as with all national narratives, is about vindicating the establishment, especially the establishment of the day. And today it's too embarrassing by half to acknowledge that the British may have had a profound role in creating the mess that has continued as a conflict ever since. Uh, but it's very difficult for uh, all of us to identify any one moment at which uh, you could say that, that uh, this is the moment for which they must make the biggest apology because... Shall we hold our breath or is it coming, the apology? Well, once they apologize for one little piece of the story, then what happens to the whole of the rest of the story? Are they supposed to apologize for empire? Are they supposed to apologize for um, what they thought was trying to keep the two sides apart in a civil war? They described Israeli-Palestinian or Jewish Arab <coughs> conflict as a war between the locals and they gave up trying to separate them. And I think to this day the tendency has been not only in London but also in other European capitals to to put the major onus on both the Israelis and the Palestinians for the continuation of the conflict. They don't want to go back into history for a variety of oh, reasons. Like That's going to be very difficult, uh, isn't it, after the case, the ruling of the High Court in October 2012 about the case being brought against the British government in relation to the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya, uh, which has opened a can of worms. It's no coincidence that since then... It also means compensation, correct? Yes, and th th they now have the right to bring a case against the government. It's no coincidence that we now also have a campaign uh, that's being put forward by the Palestinian Refugee Centre in London for an apology for the Balfour Declaration and British colonial rule in Palestine. Oh, right. I would like to um, assign to Britain a share of uh, the responsibility for the Nakba. And James mentioned Ernest Bevin, the Labour's Foreign Secretary. Uh, Bevin once said that the Balfour Declaration was the worst mistake in um, Western foreign policy in the first half of the 20th century. But he was in power after the war, after the Second World War, and he was not moved by any sentiments. He was an imperial policy uh, maker. And there is uh, a debate, one of the main bones of contention between the uh, old historians and the new historians is British uh, policy towards the end of the mandate. The old historians say that the British, uh, Britain was activated, inspired by strong anti-Zionist and even anti-Semitic calm uh, mm -hmm. sentiments and that Britain's policy was to arm and to encourage its Arab allies to invade Palestine and put an end to the Zionist um, project. Um, the new historian's perspective on British policy is rather different. Ilan Pape was the first to challenge the Zionist uh, account, um, and he claimed that um, the key to British policy uh, um, towards the end of the mandate was not pro-Israeli or pro-Arab, it was pro-British, right. British imperial interests, and the key was Greater Transjordan. In 1947, 1948, there was a tacit agreement between King Abdallah of Transjordan and the Zionist leaders to partition Palestine between themselves at the expense of the Palestinians. And this is what happened in the end. And, and a, subsidiary, uh, a subsidiary argument is that Britain knew and approved of um, this collusion across the Jordan because uh, uh, the British saw a Palestinian state as synonymous with a Mufti state.
and the Mufti was a renegade, and um, hostility to the Mufti and a Palestinian state was a constant um, factor in British policy to, to, uh, throughout um, this period. And I would say that the subtext here is that the British always understood that there would be two states and a two-state solution. There was to be an Arab state and a Jewish state, but really they thought that the Jordan River was the dividing line between the two. The Jordan River. But I think it's, it is important that despite the Bevin and the British government thought that it was in their interests um, to uh, work with the reality of United Nations support for a Jewish state at that point, uh, Bevin was no fan of the prospect of a Jewish state, even if for me reasons of realpolitik it was something that he had to go with. And at the same time, as Avi's already mentioned, that there's this uh, uh, profound distaste for the Palestinian Arab leadership. And I think that uh, we have to acknowledge that there is a, a clear continuity from this point to the present day in the international community, including the British government, of an uneasiness with what they regard as um, non-mainstream Zionism. They're always looking for <coughs> moderate Zionism, in other words, Zionism that will fit in with the international community's grand design, um, and also at the same time, quote unquote, moderate Palestinians who will also fit in with the international community's grand design. And that takes us all the way back to the First World War. When you say international community grand design, meaning what exactly? I mean in the sense that in, in terms of the, uh, of, of the quartet, uh, so the Western uh, sense driven. Absolutely. Uh, but then again, that's a bit of a complicated <laughs> yeah, element because a, if we talk about the West, it doesn't really explain the entire membership of the quartet, yeah. does it? But I think that there is a mainstream sense within international politics um, that there is a search for moderate Zionists and moderate Palestinians and that there's a way forward that, doesn't, that isn't uh, involved mutually exclusive nationalism on the parts of both parties. And I think that this is a misunderstanding of this war for statehood that goes back to the First World and War. And it's a joke, isn't it, that uh, you get some Arabs who I think probably are motivated by the desire to flatter the British, saying, but you know us so well. What a joke. I mean, basically, the British weren't seeing anything. And it's not unlike the, the, the way the British plowed in with the Americans into Iraq in 2003. And all sorts of things happened yeah. that they'd never anticipated. They, they really do not have that good a handle on the realities of the region. I'm, I, need, I must go back to the Israeli narrative, the Zionist Israeli narrative on Palestine. So in the 1980s, there was a new history that was introduced, which says, look, there are no Palestinians. These are Arabs that immigrated in the end of the 19th century to Palestine. There is no such a thing as a Palestinian people. And the likes of John Peters onward, time of a memorial and so on, advanced the idea that there, is, there needs to be a swap of refugees, Arab refugees, back to the Arab world and Jewish refugees back into their homeland. What's wrong with this Israeli argument? That um, th the you don't know Palestinians, <laughs> yes, <laughs> because it's such a completely unconvincing and implausible argument uh, because uh, the Palestinians are refugees and no one denies that. The debate is why did they become uh, refugees? The old historians said, um, they left of their own accord. The new historians say, uh, historians say they were pushed out. No one denies that there were refugees and that there were uh, three quarters of a million Palestinian refugees, more than half of the Palestinian population in Palestine. That's the biggest refugee problem and the most uh, enduring refugee yes. problem in post-war. So uh, were they history. squeezed, were they encouraged by their leaders to leave as the Zionist narratives uh, uh, introduces, or is something else? Benny Morris studied this question in very great depth and with the support of a mass of Israeli documentation. Uh, and his conclusion is that there were many reasons for the Palestinian exodus from Palestine, but the single most important, most central reason was Zionist military and psychological pressure. So by and large, most of the Palestinians were driven out and therefore Israel created this refugee problem. Israel is responsible for this um, uh, problem. And, and, the, and, the, and the, docu the, the documentary evidence yeah. includes photographs uh, obtained from the Israeli archives 
of the busing of Palestinians out of the areas in which they were living, of the separation of men and women, the organization of the population into camps to be bussed out or put in lorries out. Uh, there, there was an organization to the exodus. It didn't happen overnight, and it went on for months and months, over a year. Before I go to what uh, James talked about uh, or called uh, Palestinian mythology, I just want to finish up with the question of Israel. You mentioned the new historians and the new narrative introduced, a revisionist history of sorts. How much influence does that have in Israel? During the few years after the Oslo Accord was signed in 1993, uh, the Israeli public was quite receptive to the new perspectives. And you mean because of the political environment? Yes, because, because um, uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis have em had embarked on the road to peace. And there was greater openness to the narrative of uh, the other side. And new interpretations um, had some traction. History books for uh, secondary schools were rewritten, not uh, abandoning the old Zionist narrative, the version that I was taught at school in Israel, but opening up a debate about the causes of the Palestinian uh, exodus. And Edward Said, who wasn't a historian, thought that the new history for, uh, played quite an important part um, in Israeli politics in the decade after Oslo at three levels. He said that uh, the new historians uh, educated the Israeli public about their own history and about the relations with the uh, Arabs. It also, on, to the Palestinians, it presented a version of history which wasn't just the propaganda of the victors, it was genuine history, honest history, which corresponded to their own experience of the Nakba. And thirdly, the new history um, created a climate of opinion on both sides of the divide, which was conducive to um, uh, progress along the peace front. James, uh, uh, history perceived or revisited within the constraints of ideological and the political situation of the day? A great deal of um, the scholarship that's, that, that's been published in, in recent years about the origins of the conflict and uh, the evolution of the conflict, um, there's a uh, willingness to accept and to emphasize, I think, uh, quite clearly uh, the significant uh, role that was played by the British. Um, but I think that in a lot of the historiography, there's still a tendency to go down either one path or another that, um, that essentially, uh, for example, with reference to the British, that they were either pro-Zionist yeah. or that they were anti-Palestinian. But th there is a new history that speaks more to the commonalities between Palestinians and Jews in the early part of the century than later perceived to be. Well, it depends whether... Which, I mean, a common which, sociology of sort, if you uh, will. There's uh, an attempt to restudy Palestinian-Israeli well, relations, Palestinian-Jewish relations in Well, Palestine. Avi hasn't yet mentioned uh, historians of Europe, <laughs> like Shlomo Sand, who've, right. who've questioned... Uh, the, have talked about the invention of the Jewish people. Right. Um, and there's a thesis out there that says that the Palestinians are also Jews. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, it, this can go on and on. Um, what I would say in terms of the situation and its tragedy, because we have uh, Palestinians either living outside historical Palestine as refugees or within the West Bank and Gaza as refugees and citizens, uh, I beg your pardon, inhabitants of land under occupation. And if they are to have the rights, recognition of their rights as human beings and as the uh, the victims of a sequence or series of catastrophes and to have representation, citizenship somewhere, um, if that is to happen, then it possibly is the case that the British could help by acknowledging that they have, take some of the heat, take some of the weight, and revisit their own history and say that there are a lot of people who, had they acted differently, could have prevented some of this spinning out the way it did. Instead, we have Tony Blair now, the representative of the international community in Palestine. Uh, all, all the parties to this conflict 
need to reassess the history in the light of new evidence. This is what the new historians have done, and I think this encouraged the emergence of new historians, and we have eminent new historians like Professor Rashid Khalidi of Columbia University. And uh, Edward Said once wrote to me and asked me to organize a conference at Oxford on the moral and political consequences of 1948. For him, the moral consequences came before the um, political consequences. That's significant. The result was a conference we organized and a book that Eugene Rogan and I co-edited on uh, the war for Palestine, rewriting the history of 1948. But to go back to an earlier discussion we had, his history isn't written in a vacuum. History is written in a political context. And the emergence of the new history in the late 1980s owed very much to the aftermath of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon mm. in 1982, which was very controversial and aroused a great deal of criticism of the Israeli establishment. And that o opened up a space for going further back to re-examine critically Israel's history. And similarly, as a result of the outbreak of the Second Intifada in 2000, uh, the Israeli minds have become closed again. There's been a reversal to fundamentalist positions to us and them to this notion that the Palestinians cannot be trusted, that the Oslo Accord was a mistake, and um, the whole of the Arab world is against us, and we must stand up and fight for uh, ourselves. But I guess it's, we're back to ground zero, or point zero, as it were. Yeah. Rosemary, gentlemen, we're going to have to end. Thank you for joining us. Until next time.